Welcome to the Wisp Mama Bear Podcast, Episode 21. I'm your host, Sarah Yacoub. Today's topic, gender and politics and life after the 100. We are so blessed to have special guest Jessica Katzenmeyer with us today. Jessica was among the amazing Democratic women running for state assembly in Wisconsin. She was nationally recognized as one of the top LGBTQ plus candidates to watch for in this election cycle. As of August 11th, 2020, she became the first transgender woman to ever win an election in Milwaukee and Waukesha counties. She was endorsed by the now president-elect Joe Biden. Jessica has been an actress in community theater, a host of a podcast, and a Teamsters Union member for over 12 years. The grand plan was to live stream our hour-long Zoom conversation. Technology had a different idea, and unfortunately that didn't happen. We did, however, record it, and I'm so happy to share portions of our conversation and our time here together today. Among the things we talked about was the general fear of the unknown, and how a lot of anger and distrust in our society comes from fearing that which we do not know, or with which we are not familiar. Jessica shared some of her experiences as a transgender woman. It really takes a lot to get to where I am today. I've been trans- transitioning now, if I could talk, uh, for seven years. Wow. And, and uh, you know, you have to go through a lot of things before you even begin transitioning. There's a, a therapy period that you have to go through to make sure that that you are knowing of what you're doing by putting hormones that are different than your natural birth hormones mm-hmm. into your body. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, there's a small amount of estrogen and uh, and biological males, but you're increasing the estrogen hormone to uh, to uh, create more feminine characteristics like the size of your breasts, mm. uh, smooth skin, and uh, feminizing your figure and shape. And and people don't realize that there's a lot behind the scenes that you risk for being me. Uh, being on hormones, I'm at an increased risk of stroke. Mm. And so I have to constantly monitor things like my my blood pressure. And that's why it's it's, it's not easy. And But this is who I am. And this is what I do to express myself as who I, who I am. And there's also been studies showing that children as young as three and four can determine how they feel as their gender is which to me just blows my mind and for me i knew something was different about me around eight years old when i noticed i was taking a liking into more feminine type things and i didn't really understand because i didn't really i I grew up in a very conservative household that wasn't really open to these ideas but i i learned more about the potential of being transgender at a later time in life. So that's kind of how where I got to where I am today. You know, it took my parents a little while to get around to accepting me okay. for who I am. And I want to tell you that my parents are big Trump supporters. Okay. They are conservatives, but they love me and they accept me for who I am. My mom and I are like best friends. Oh. My mom's taken me clothes shopping. She's bought me clothes. I love it. Uh, for, and our relationship is much, much better now uh, as, as a result of them accepting for who I am. Oh. And I, I think that is a, it's a beautiful thing. Jessica and I discussed the number of women running for the Wisconsin State Legislature this past election cycle and how, if it wasn't actually a record, it certainly felt like one given the strength of all of the campaigns. And I, I want to say, too, we had a lot of women running this year for state assembly. Yes, we Not did. Not just a lot of us. I mean, there was a lot of others, too. And maybe one of the most uh, female candidates that we've had in any given election year. But I don't know. I, I'd have to look at that. But uh, I think that's pretty incredible. Among the challenges of being a member of a marginalized group is the tendency of some, or perhaps many, to reduce someone or their interests in politics to one single issue. Jessica nipped that one in the butt. Yes, being an transgender woman, I definitely had a lot of challenges during the campaign. Sure. I had to uh, break away this thinking of, oh, she's running just because she's transgender. Mm -hmm. No, I'm running because I believe I'm the better candidate. Politics in general have a reputation for being, well, ugly. The lie is that it's equally ugly on both sides. If you look at attacks of Democrats on Republicans this past election cycle, 
they were based in truth and rooted in the record or legislative judgment of the target. Contrast that with the attacks from Republicans on Democratic candidates. Republican attacks on Democratic candidates were unapologetically dishonest, deeply personal, and just cruel. They were especially ugly for Democratic women. This past election cycle, the Wisconsin Republican Party really capitalized off of the tolerance we have here in Wisconsin for beating up on women. They were very much threatened by Jessica. Yeah, I mean, I had, uh, by election day, there was a attack website. There was an attack Facebook page. Uh, there was several attack mailers that I was notified of that people were getting. Mm. Of course, all lies. Uh, one of the, the best things about the uh, website goes live the same day that uh, our now uh, president-elect uh, Joe Biden endorsed me, uh, says that, her politics are too extreme for Joe Biden. <laughs> like, ah, 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 Actually, Biden. they're not. <laughs> right, right. And, and they like to use uh, the terms of, like, my favorite is radical. Uh-huh. Uh, and, of course, I know that both Sarah and I, uh, we got called a radical. And I'm like, yeah, I know I'm a pretty radical chick here. I'm pretty awesome. People you know, could have a beer with me, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So I thought like turn it around and kind of turn a, turn a negative into a positive on it. <laughs> well, I love your suggestion. So Jessica and I would talk throughout the campaign and like, wow, we're really rad. And I still want to do sort of an 80s, you know, hit up the thrift store, get some sunglasses and take some neon uh, pictures of us being rad. Um yeah. I, I mean, it's just, it's comical. When it got towards uh, election day, we were doing a lot of Facebook ads, uh, as well as uh, other forms of advertising online. I ended up getting a lot of hate messages I had to deal with, and people commenting on my looks. I mean, as women, we're already scrutinized a lot, and uh, being a trans woman, it's even more you know, scrutiny that comes with that. And, you know, you look on these people's pages and some of them they claim to be Christian or whatever and you know what that's like what you said why can't we just treat people like humans it yeah. just goes a long way to show a little bit of empathy a little bit of love and I had to fight through this and I did I uh, honestly what got me through is just not paying attention to any of that as much as I could and just stay focused on the end goal and I want to show others that hey you know what I'm in a marginalized community, look what I did, you could do this as well. In addition to grace as the foundation to resilience, Jessica and I had a chance to talk themes like leadership. We both share in the philosophy that public service is about going to bat for everybody in the community, even those who are a never-ending source of some of the ugliest hate mail. I was going to say, you know, my philosophy in leadership is lead by example. If I want people to do something, you know, I'm going to do it as well too. I'm not going to ever tell somebody to do something if I wasn't comfortable doing it myself. Right. Um, and like I said, uh, you know, people, I had, I had a huge following in this campaign. I know, uh, especially here in Wisconsin, and it, it has stretched out across many states in the country, you know, from West Coast to East Coast. And it was pretty incredible to see because I, when I was getting named in these magazines and stuff, you know, I, I got to the point, I had people who loved me, following me. I had people who were like, okay, you know, she seems kind of cool following me. I had people who hated me following me and you know like I said with the haters uh if I had won I would still be your representative I'd still listen to you you know just because I'm a democrat doesn't mean I'm not gonna listen to you right because that's how I feel like a leadership leads by example you know some of my really good friends are republicans yeah you know and and, and despite us having political difference and I hate that there's this notion of uh, fighting between both parties and this divide that that divides us. And I've seen relationships breaking up. I've seen families breaking up, friendships breaking up over our political beliefs. And it doesn't need to be this way. Right. Believe in what you want to. That's fine. Vote right. for Trump if that's who you want to vote for. That's fine. Just show some love and some compassion. Right. Well, and you, you raised so many good points. The you know, neither side has a monopoly on the right answer. Like there is no universal, perfect policy approach that fixes every problem all the time. So you have to pull from both sides. For me, it's not the ideology or whether someone relates to and um, 
identifies with, you know, the conservative, the Republican end of the spectrum, it's the style of leadership. So there are toxic Democratic leaders and there are toxic Republican leaders. Um, right now, it feels like we have a lot of toxic Republican leaders in the legislature. And that's why, you know, it's not and it's a hard message to communicate. You know, Republican thought is not inherently, you know, evil. That And that's what gets communicated. Yeah. Is you, you're judging me because I'm a Republican. No, um, I'm, ha I'm having trouble understanding why you keep supporting someone. So or my dog Zoe says hi. Um, <laughs> I'm having trouble understanding why you're supporting someone who's so hurtful. Um, or, you know, like take last winter, uh, the, the homelessness uh, money. There was $3.7 million. Governor Evers called for a session. All it took was the Joint Finance Committee uh, getting together and dispersing the funds. The money was already there. They just had to sit down and get it out. And, you know, how many, it's close to 5,000, uh, just over 4,500 uh, homeless people estimated in 2019, and they refused to do it. And Governor Evers went ahead and convened the session, and they didn't show up. And it's, you know, what are you doing? Um, so that's, it's, for me, it's an issue of leadership, not so much of policy. Yeah. As our conversation turned a corner to talk about the CW series, The 100, now streaming on Netflix, it became abundantly clear that because neither one of us wanted to spoil anything for anyone, our recorded conversation stayed at the surface in terms of subject matter depth. Jessica, like me, loved the series, and we've had some fascinating conversations behind the scenes privately that perhaps we'll be able to capture and share some time down the road. For now, I'll just leave it as a two-thumbs-up recommendation for anyone who wants to watch something with great characters, fascinating storylines, smart writing, brilliant social commentary, and lessons in humanity that we need now more than ever. Episode 22 tomorrow. See you there.